Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this evening for what's the sixth in our menopause series of Restless Presents with our partners, My Menopause Centre. And on this occasion, we are looking at how to kickstart good habits to power up your menopause. Before I hand over to Helen, who will chair this evening's event, I just wanted to remind you all of a few housekeeping points. Um, you can post your questions and thoughts in the chat function at the bottom of your screens. Feel free to post throughout the presentation, and there'll also be time for questions at the end. The event is recorded and will be mailed to everyone who's registered this evening, along with links to other resources. It'll also be available to view on our YouTube channel, as well as within the menopause section of Restless. I'd like to hand over now to our panel chair, Helen Normoyle, who is co-founder of My Menopause Center. Helen has held chief marketing officer roles across the healthcare, beauty, broadcast, furniture, and property sectors, and is a self-described women's wellness champion. Over to you, Helen. Brilliant, thank you so much, Mel. And good evening, everyone, and happy new year. I hope that you had a lovely festive break and that 2023 is off to a fantastic start for you. Um, we all know that this time of year presents us with an amazing opportunity to make really meaningful changes that can improve our overall well-being, which becomes even more important as we're going through the menopause. But we've all been there, started the new year with the best of intentions and a long list of, you know, really well thought out and well intended resolutions, but within days have ditched them because they were just too ambitious or just too boring you know, life has to be worth living for. So the secret really is to take a realistic and a sustainable approach. And that's what we're going to be talking about this evening with my fabulous My Menopause Centre co-founder, menopause expert, Dr. Claire Spencer, mm. the co-founder of the brilliant fitness community, Her Spirit, Mel Berry, and the very wonderful Karen Newby, a nutritionist and author of The Natural Menopause Method, a nutritional guide to perimenopause and beyond which we'd highly recommend, and we're serializing in blogs over our coming newsletters as well. Now, we've had some questions submitted in advance. Thank you very much for those, and we'll weave them into the conversation. As Mel said, if you have any questions, pop them into the chat, and Emma, our fabulous social media manager, is on hand to help manage them, and also link to any relevant articles that any of us have to share with you. So, Claire, we'll kick off with a question for you. So, one of the questions that I know you hear a lot and that we hear a lot in our community is, why is menopause impacting my overall well-being so much? In particular, what is going on at my weight? You know, we hear so many women say, my weight is just creeping up on me, despite my eating habits not changing, my exercise not, regime not changing. What's going on? Yeah, so it's really impossible to say that there is one single thing and really, I think of it more of a vicious cycle of lots of contributing factors. So if we think about menopause symptoms and divide them really basically into vasomotor, so hot flushes, night sweats, um, physical symptoms, um, particularly um, I'm thinking aches and pains, I'm thinking bladder symptoms, um, poor sleep. Um, and then we add on to that the psychological symptoms that are so common for so many women. So low mood, anxiety, um, loss of motivation, um, and really all of this impacting in so low self-esteem. So you can see how a vicious cycle gets set up of poor sleep, causing tiredness. You've got anxiety, low mood that are all worse by poor sleep. Um, aches and pains as well that can stop um, some women wanting to go out and adding all of those up together equaling a loss of motivation and so whether that's having an impact then on not wanting to exercise or stopping exercise not wanting to tackle diet you know falling into bad habits and reaching to comfort food snack cupboard ingredients and contents you can sort of see how it all very sadly fits together. And I know we're going to talk about weight gain in a bit more detail in a second, but you know, the hormonal changes of the menopause also impact on how you metabolism carbohydrates and sugar in particular, um, in ways that then all add up to making your body more prone to weight gain and putting fat on around the middle, that belly fat, middle-aged spread horrible fat, then promotes more insulin resistance, which again is just all compounding the problem. And then muscle wasting is an issue. We 
lose muscle if we don't use it. And then our metabolic rate slows, we're burning less calories. So very long answer. You can see how there are so many, so many factors that are all interacting on how you might be feeling, at, particularly at this time of the year. Brilliant. And Karen, any thoughts from you in terms of, you know, what you see when people come to you from a nutrition perspective and they're they're looking at this weight gain? Yeah, I think, um, like Claire was saying, that sort of reactionary <clears throat> response to foods, if you're exhausted, you are going to reach for more caffeine, you are going to reach for more refined carbohydrates because you're exhausted. Um, so as a, um, in terms of a nutritionist, it's about what can we add in to um, your sort of daily habits to help you become less reactionary? Um, because the how we sleep or how tomorrow, you know, tomorrow starts today. And if we don't, um, you know, and everything that's going in here affects how well we sleep, which affects how well we feel tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking a bit later about what things we can add in to, to help that vicious cycle. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and that's great, Karen. And I know we'll come to it. And Mel, I know we'll, we'll come to talk about exercise more broadly in just a moment as well. But I know one of the things that, that you've mentioned previously is around exercise and weight gain. So any, any kind of initial thoughts from you? Yeah, I think one of the things, and, and thank you, Claire and Karen, for your views and thoughts, it's about heart raising. I think at times we don't understand heart rate and what we need to do. So if you look at context, the chief medical office recommendation is 150 minutes of you know heart raising activity. I think when people move, they don't understand it. So I kind of talk a little bit about that. And Claire, you know, you picked up on, you know, metabolic uh, weight and rate. Right. And, and <laughs> muscle, muscle is the magic pill on that. It helps to keep your metabolism um, high. And as we mature, we just need to look at the way that we approach being active in a slightly different way. But again, we'll talk about that later. Thanks, Mel. That's great. So really great framing there of some of the challenges that, that we face as our as our body changes. Now, before we go delve into this in more detail, Claire, one of the things I know that we often talk about is in the menopause transition. So perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, the postmenopausal stage of life, which is where we're going to spend an enormous amount of time and ever growing, is one that's not as well understood. What are the key health conditions that we need to bear in mind where nutrition and exercise can really help us as well? Yeah, no, that's a really great point, Helen, because at the moment we might not be particularly thinking about our heart health or cardiovascular um, risk and our bone health, so risk of osteoporosis, but changes are happening now that can impact on your health in the future. And so osteoporosis is thinning of the bones where our bones become more fragile and prone to fracture. And it's really common, one in three women will experience an osteoporotic fracture um, at some stage in their life. And I'm just checking through the statistics here, um, the, the way it dramatically increases as you lose estrogen. So 2% of women have osteoporosis at the age of 50, but then up to a quarter by the time that we're 70. And bec that's because estrogen, that key hormone in our ovaries, is so um, important in maintaining healthy bones. And it's if you don't want to take HRT, if you've been advised not to take HRT, even if you do take HRT, you know, looking at your diet, vitamin D, calcium particularly, looking at exercise, so um, impact exercise or muscle gaining exercise can really decrease your risk. Um, there are other risk factors such as smoking, drinking too much alcohol, um, and some medical conditions also that can put you at increased risk. So definitely worth a look at. Um, and then cardiovascular disease that we're all maybe a little more familiar with. But I think what many women don't realize is that twice as, twice as many women will sadly die from heart disease as they will from breast cancer. And that's not to diminish or belittle the risk of breast cancer in any way but really stark statistics that we may be concerned about that now, obviously, and understandably, but bear in mind heart disease also. And so again, it, you know, exercise, as Mel has said, it's looking at nutrition, how much alcohol are you drinking? What's your weight? Um, lots of different risk factors that we can alter now to reduce our risk for the future. So really good shout out, Helen, 
to make us aware of those two particular important health conditions. Brilliant. And then I think maybe if we, um, Claire, we might come back to other ways of managing those symptoms other than exercise and nutrition. We will talk about HR, HRT a little bit at the end, but maybe mm. if we, mm. now that we have that framing and understanding from you to help us understand what's going on with our body, all of the different things that can combine to, to, to us putting on weight and putting it on around our waist in particular, and really underscoring, you know, knowledge is, is power, knowledge is empowering. So hopefully with an understanding of the risks that are there with bone health and heart health, really thinking now about the role of exercise and nutrition. And Mel, we'll kick off to you. You're, you're, you're a fitness expert. You've created an amazing community for women to motivate, you know, middle-aged women to take up exercise because mm. it can be transforming in terms of changing mm. health outcomes for people. So what are, what are your thoughts or what are your advice in terms of, as we change, what's different when you're in your 40s and 50s about the type of exercise that you should be doing? Yeah, I mean, look, I think I'll start with context. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. When you get to your 50s, which I am proud of being, you lose between 10 and 5 and 10 percent of lean muscle mass. So from somebody like myself who's come from a swimming background, you know, I, I had no problem retaining muscle mass. And that changed a lot about how I was active, what I did. And it was wonderful to see there's a post in there from Kerry that she changed her hit training to then doing kind of strength training yoga. So, you know, good on you, Kerry, mm. for, for doing that. You contextualize that, that only 25 percent of women in the UK meet the chief medical officer's recommendation so that's two strength sessions um, a, a week and that's about you know using your your body weight so we have to educate and you always talk about Helen how knowledge is power and I think that is really really important so anybody that is on this call strength training isn't complicated strength training isn't suddenly going to turn you into you know a bodybuilding um, physique it's going to make you a powerful strong woman and we've got so many examples and for us what are we her spirit is a community of women that walk run swim cycle together and if you have the chance go and have a look at our social channels there's a woman called sue i call her super sue she's 66 and she did a little video for us and she said, I was going down the road of not being able to put my knickers, her word, not mine, and socks on. And I don't want to be an old lady. And she's probably one of the strongest women mentally and physically um, that, that I've seen. So context, educate, no, strength training is a must and something that, you know, I love and would recommend to anybody that's listening today. Mel, can we elaborate on that a bit? Because I took part in your Couch to Kilos uh, program last year and I absolutely fell in love with strength training. And if you hadn't made me uh, do yes. the Couch to Kilos program along with Holly and your considerable powers of persuasion, I honestly don't think <laughs> I ever, I it, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have crossed my mind that it was something that I would enjoy. I would have thought I'm too old, too flabby to go into the gym. I wasn't really sure that I'd enjoy it or that I'd like it, but I did. And you guys were great. You took me out. You, you know, you showed me how to kind of do the basics. I followed your course online. It made me right. I absolutely loved it. And the, it, it's changed how I feel about my body. But if somebody had said to me, oh, Helen, strength training is amazing before that, I actually wouldn't have known what that meant. So can you explain to people who are maybe not familiar with what strength training is? What does it entail? And, and, and you know, looking at your amazing Sue who we'd love to meet and hear her story you know what did she do very practically what are the things that people do and, and the difference that it can make yeah so let's pick up on couch to kilos what is it it's our partnership with British weightlifting and for us it's about educating every woman and and her spirit we are a digital solution so I think Emma's you know posted in so go to herspirit.co.uk or couch to kilos.co.uk so what do you do you don't need equipment you can use your body Body weight is an amazing thing to be able to do. And I know, Claire, we very much are on the same page in terms of osteoporosis. And somebody who's osteoporotic, like, you know, like, like I am, is it, it's a must. And there's levels. So every four weeks, we take women on a journey through our amazing coach, another Mel, so Mel Young, to educate them, to take them through the basic functional movement. As you get better, 
which we do because consistency is key. And if you can two or three times a week to then be able to do it, you go, what can I do next? And I know that was your journey, um, Helen. Get some dumbbells, you know, having been in Lidl and Sainsbury's over the last couple of weeks, they're selling those dumbbells at a cheap price that just adds a little bit of extra kind of resistance. And as you become more curious, you can take couch to kilos to the gym. So it's very simple. You know, you take our coaches programs and they tell you what to do. Why don't you take on? barbells and all the you know things that I know that you Helen have got in your gym and I hope you're using the big big shiny ones and and you've progressed and look it's strength is power and and it's beautiful to see and hear Helen you know you talk about you look at your body in a very different way and and that's you know that's a it's great so come and join us couch to kilos if you haven't joined us from day one, which was the beginning of January, you can just play it back, do it when you want to, do it with who you want to, bring your kids, bring anybody. Um, so yeah, get involved in strength training as a must. And then Mel, in, a, in addition, so that was a, a clearly really, really clear outline of why strength training is a great thing to do. And you mentioned uh, Kerry, who spoke about changing her routine, combining yoga, weight training and skipping. What other forms of exercise have you found to be helpful for your community members? I think, first of all, find what you enjoy and find what makes you smile inside and out. I think that when we try and do something for others, we try to do something that pleases others. And that's not necessarily right um, for, for them. And through her spirit, we believe in giving a woman, you know, choice. So. From an online point of view, yoga, Pilates, indoor cycling, in person, you know, running. We're partnering with Park Run because Park Run are trying to get more women moving and movement. So non-essential exercise, moving every day is really critical. And you can come and join us for Park Run. You can walk, you can run, you can jog, whatever that you might want to. Um, and as you both know, and I've tried to coerce you into it still to be successful, Swimming is a great, obviously, kind of strength building exercise, both um, in the pool, not so much outdoors at the moment. I've definitely kind of shied away. But look, to conclude on that point, Helen, is find what's right for you. Find what makes you happy. Find a tribe. Find the people that you want to enjoy the time with. And, and for us, we talk about it in a very simple way. Find a community. Find a challenge that makes your heart flip and gives you a little bit of you know genuine nervous excitement and then find a coach we've got great coaches that can inform you and give you the right knowledge don't go on a facebook group and ask for a question come to her spirit and ask our really uh, knowledgeable coaches what's right um for me so everything even to you know the ones that you probably didn't think that you were going to do so i look forward to swimming with both of you in the summer yeah, right. Uh, yes, of course, Matt. Yes, I'm looking forward to it too. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> this will be your third year in a row getting trying to get that to work. Mel, um, that was brilliant. Find your joy, find your tribe, you know, excellent advice. And also find somebody who's expert in it rather than relying on, you know, the, the, the well-intentioned advice from people who maybe don't really know what they're talking about or don't understand your particular challenges. But we've got a, a great question here from Pauline, which you might have seen. And what Pauline would like to know is, what if you have mobility problems, what exercises can you do? So what Pauline's saying, if you can't walk very far or quickly enough to raise a heart rate. Yeah, so I mean, I guess there's two questions in there, Pauline. So the mobility problem, is there anything that, you know, helps you to become a little bit more mobile? Um, and again, you know, things like yoga, Pilates, don't underestimate strength training in terms of how strength mm. training is heart raising activity people think mm. that that isn't the case if you want to listen to some of our great podcasts you know we had an amazing um guest called dr stacy sims i know that was one that you were unfortunately not able to join us in the end but you know she talks about her language you know lifting heavy bleep 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 because actually that really raises your heart rate so that would be another suggestion um, and then if you can't walk far enough, I guess, from a mobility point of view, can you use an exercise bike? You know, you're static, mm. so it's not weight bearing. And it's a great way that then mobilizes your joints because actually you're non weight bearing. Um, and it's back to the wonderful swimming, because, again, it's a non weight bearing and it's great for your mobility because you're going through a joint 
set of actions that again give you strength give you mobility and definitely uh, raise your heart rate so Pauline would love to see you at Her Spirit come and join us and hopefully I can just give you a little bit more kind of direction um, on that so yeah hopefully that helps to answer that question. That was great, mm -hmm. Mel. Thank you very much. And I know there's some questions in here for Karen, and we're definitely going to come to them. Karen, you might have seen them in the in, in the chat um, as well. Now, Claire, one of the things that can happen, of course, is that there are certain menopause-related symptoms that you can have, such as you know, joint aches, muscle pains, bladder issues, you know, mm -hmm. incontinence mm -hmm. that can stop you from exercising. So Based on your experience of all, you know, you've seen thousands and supported thousands of women on their on their menopause journey. Mm. What are the key things that you see come up that stop women from exercising? And what's your advice on how to manage them so that they can get back into into exercising? Yeah. So um, as I said in my introduction, really, it's the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of menopause symptoms can have an impact. I think many women don't realize or didn't realize that um, aches and pains can be a, a really debilitating symptom of the menopause, for example. And then, Helen, as you said, the whole range of physical and psychological symptoms. So in terms of solutions, um, so HRT obviously is for many women, not every woman, but for many women is the most effective way of managing menopause symptoms, particularly aches and pains. It can have a really profound positive effect. If your aches and pains are due to loss of estrogen, if you give just a small amount of estrogen back, it can really help. And I think HRT psychologically can act a bit like a springboard. So although it's not going to talk in your natter in your ear and tell you to get out there, I think if you feel generally better, if you've taken the edge off your symptoms, then that can then spring you into feeling like you've just got that tiny bit of mojo back to then want to go out and do something, however small, and then, you know, a positive cycle, a snowball effect of feeling better from doing that small thing, from addressing diet, et cetera. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be HRT. If aches and pains are an issue, then seeing a physiotherapist. And many GP practices have physio first, where instead of seeing a GP, you can ask the receptionist if there's a possibility of getting an appointment with a physio to give you specific advice for your symptoms. Um, if it's a bladder that's stopping you, then it's going to be finding the right exercise for you. You know, if you're a trampoliner and you've got stress incontinence, you might want to change to something that's not trampolining. So, you know, you might have to do a tiny bit of adaptation while you're addressing your pelvic floor issues with physiotherapy, doing your pelvic floor exercises. Vaginal estrogens can be helpful for some bladder issues related to the menopause as well. So. Hopefully you're getting the sense that, you know, it might be cognitive behavioral therapy that you need to just change your mindset back to where it was previously. Um, talking therapies, physio, you may need medication to help some of your symptoms, um, the HRT, community, you know, just anything that gives you a little tiny bit of joy in what you're doing as well. So again many facets to that one question brilliant and thank you so much claire and i know emma thank you for putting in lots of posts there and i suppose the key message here is there's an awful lot of um things that you can do to remove those barriers that stop you from exercising mm -hmm. and i know one of the key things now would be nutrition as well and karen thank you so much for for joining us this evening mm -hmm. we posted one of your blogs this week uh, on our newsletter. I know we've got some great new content coming from you over the next few weeks as well. And thank you very much for that. Now, we've al already got some questions for you in here, but Karen, this is the time of year where I think I'm 50, almost 55. And I think for probably at least 40 of those 55 years, every January I've started with, this is the year my eating habits are just going to be, you know, I will be beyond virtuous with, you know, how I'm going to be and by the, you know, 6th of January and like oh sod it it was just too boring and too hard and I know I'm not alone hmm. so as a nutritionist I'm sure you see this all the time and I'm sure every year you see a new fatty diet introduced as well so if we cut to the chase Karen what are your healthy eating recommendations and tell us why fatty diets are a waste of time mm, okay well I think if there was um 
ever a month to um, enjoy food and to um, nourish ourselves. It's January, um, you know, all these kind of mad sort of detoxes and cleanses, you know, naturopathically, the best time to sort of cleanse and do things like that is spring, um, the change of seasons, whereas January is a cold, dark, bleak month. Um, <clears throat> however, for me, diets don't work. Um, my approach to dieting is don't. Um, but there are some kind of things that um, I like to talk about really to help us with weight gain. And, you know, there's often a, a, a perimenopause, like a sudden weight gain that often like um, Claire said often goes around the middle we start to get a more male pattern of weight gain as our estrogen starts to dip um, and you know these are very much the sort of the joys of womanhood but we have you know a lot of metabolic changes going on because estrogen and its effect is everywhere and certainly from my perspective a lot of that is in the, in our um, ability to handle estrogen and um, fats as well sorry not estrogen sugar um, and fat. So for me, my biggest thing is please don't diet because actually there's, um, you know, we go on average of four diets a year. And as soon as uh, we come off them, the weight goes back on. It's not sustainable. And I've seen a question here about, you know, cutting out sugars. That's not sustainable. Um, for me, it's all about um, crowding out these cravings for um, sugar, for example, with nutrient dense food. So it's about, um, you know, I, I want I want you to actually eat more, um, but eat more nutrient dense foods as opposed to the energy dense foods. And, um, you know, we all know what we kind of should be doing, um, but we don't do it. And why is that? Well, it's because, you know, like Dr. Claire was saying, all of these kind of issues are compounding at, at menopause where we have, um, you know, hugely high stress. We're often at the top of our career. Um, we're often for many of us, we're dealing with small children in the house or teenagers in the house. You know, my mother had me at 23. I'd left home by the time she went through menopause. Um, uh, you know, and, you know, we have huge amounts of stress. And unfortunately, cortisol and high stress actually exacerbates this weight round the middle, which is often called the worry waste. Um, and this weight round the middle, it's not the same as other weight that we get on our arms and our legs. It's not inert. It starts to increase um, sort of inflammation in the body, um, which isn't terribly helpful for us at menopause, which can then exacerbate things like aches and pains, which are inflammatory conditions. So for me, it is about eating more nutrient dense foods. And so so what do I mean by that? I mean, um, more plants. Um, I'm not vegan, um, but I think we could all be more vegan. Um, I like to talk about giving yourself a sort of a, um, a test to try and get 30 different unique plants in your diet a week. And that can be herbs and spices and um, fruits and vegetables and pulses, um, legumes, nuts and seeds, things like um cooking more curries and more to jeans where suddenly you're getting you're using spices and you're using herbs to flavor food as opposed to salts you know and certainly when we're looking at cardiovascular and long-term chronic um you know diseases we need to be this is preventative medicine because all of those nutrient dense foods are going to be giving you the spark plugs um which will help give you more energy which will help you sleep better and for me weight loss um, isn't actually something we should be thinking about. We, I want all of my patients to feel more energized. So then they want to move more. Um, and I want you to feel more grounded. I want you to feel more um, in control. And all of these things, once you get all of these things right, the weight loss is a really nice side effect. Um, you know, weight loss is important if we're overweight at menopause, but it shouldn't, for me, it's not the focus. If we focus on these things first, we're going to feel so much better and we will want to move more and we'll be more, we'll be one step ahead of cravings. So not only is um, more nutrient dense foods important, more protein is important. And one of the reasons why protein is so important, not only to support that lean muscle mass wastage that uh, Mel was talking about, because we don't actually have pools of uh, proteins in our body like we do have pools of fat and pools of um, glucose. We don't have protein, so we need to be getting it in every meal and snack. Um, but the importance of protein is that it helps us give us a drip feed of energy and it helps to crowd out that need for sugar. 
And one of the biggest reasons why we can't stop eating or we're craving carbohydrates is because we're getting what's called a blood sugar low. So if you feel shaky or hangry or feel, um, you know, a different person after eating as well, a bit shaky, these are all signs of lows in blood sugar. And as we said at the start, you know, our, meta, our metabolism changes and estrogen is unfortunately um, connected to our ability to be able to handle uh, sugar. And as estrogen dips, we become more insulin resistant, which means that we need more of the storage hormone insulin to be able to deal with food, hence weight gain. Um, so in order to stop those kind of lows in blood sugar, um, I like to see like refined carbohydrates is like putting petrol onto our energy fire. You know, if we have cake and biscuits and even see pasta and a bowl of rice as sugar, we get this massive kind of surge of energy and then we get that blood sugar low. So the flames burn really bright and then they go really small and then that's when we get hangry. Whereas actually um, protein is like putting coal onto our energy fire. Um, the flames don't burn as bright, but they burn for much longer and they give us satiety. You know, protein is makes you feel satisfied. And this is also the same with fat. We need fat to lose fat. It sounds contraindicative, but it's not. And the fat that I'm talking about, even saturated fat, you know, I use butter. I'd rather people use lard than um, these refined omega-3 fat, uh, omega-6 fats, which are very pro-inflammatory because at least fat anchors your hunger. So we've never snacked as much as we do now. And it's not because of the fats, it's because of the sugar. We are, our diet is so full of refined carbohydrates that we are constantly in this kind of high and low of blood sugar. So my final point really is, well, there are other foods which are important, the protein, the fat, complex carbohydrates are fine. Please don't think you need to do away with carbohydrates. More of a keto focus, I suppose, but I don't even like to use that keto. You know, to be in ketosis is really extreme and not something that I would recommend. Mm. Um, but, you know, phytoestrogens are important. So these are a wonderful, mag massive amounts of foods um, that you've, uh, phytoestrogens include things like brassicas and ground linseed and the soy family of foods that help to buffer those kinds of roller coasters of estrogens, um, which cause all these kind of exacerbate all these, these sort of effects. Um, but then we then come to, so, so my kind of final point is actually, the biggest thing that you can do is to focus on the first hour of your day. Whatever happens to the rest of the day doesn't matter. So I find that when we're very overwhelmed, we've got all this information out there and actually we can't, we, we don't even know where to start. So if we just work on the first hour of our day and the first thing that I recommend is when you wake up to have a warm water with a slice of lemon, and the reason why I recommend this is because it's very hydrating, because we're dehydrated when we wake up. The lemon helps to stimulate our liver, which helps to, you know, the liver is incredibly important at, at menopause. Um, and the liver is in charge of digesting fats. And um, to save your caffeine to have with your breakfast. And the reason this is so important is because caffeine puts us into stress mode. It puts us immediately into fight or flight mode. And you kind of know this when you have too much caffeine, you feel really jangly and like, um, we're already stressed. We wake up stressed. We do not need caffeine. So I actually say, have your caffeine with a protein rich breakfast. And if you don't feel hungry at breakfast time, I'd recommend you eat your evening meal earlier to fast overnight for at least 12 to 14 hours and eat a protein rich breakfast. As the saying goes, eat as the path of the sun. For most of us, we're eating in the completely opposite way. We're not eating, we're missing breakfast. Then we're having loads of, or having tea and toast on the run. Then we're having some sort of snacks mid morning because suddenly we're getting a sugar low because caffeine also affects our sugar as well, our sugar balance. Um, and then we're sort of grabbing a sandwich at lunchtime. Then suddenly at three o'clock, we are so ravenous because we haven't actually fueled ourselves. And we need that fuel at breakfast and lunch and a lighter evening meal to work with our, the energy needed for our day. And so even just focusing on those, those two things, protein rich breakfast, hot water and lemon on waking, caffeine only with breakfast and a a good protein rich breakfast. If you were to have your evening meal for breakfast, 
how different you would feel. And actually, when you go to India, when you go to Asia, when you go to Africa, they will be eating the same thing for breakfast, lunch and dinner, which is what we used to do, the full English breakfast. You know, if we if we had a full English breakfast, I tell you, we would not, you know, we would be able to go to lunch easily without without caffeine and without snacking. So there, that's kind of my sort of uh, things to, to, to think about. So that, that was fantastic. And there's so many things in, in there, um, so many amazing insights in there and things that are very counterintuitive, like, you know, saying you've got to eat fats to lose fats, that you don't need to deprive yourself. And it's not about eating less. It's about eating more of the right things. So if you to maybe bring this to life for people. So, you know, love your recommendation around really focus on the first hour of the day and start with a cup of water with a slight hot water with a slice of lemon, because that, that's not an expensive thing to do either but if you could advise you know if you were thinking about a meal plan for a day Karen to really you know give some color to this for people what would you know what would you recommend for breakfast what's a good protein rich breakfast what would you well, recommend yeah. for lunch and what would you recommend for dinner or supper okay um well breakfast you know eggs any which way don't worry about the cholesterol uh, you know it has eggs are an amazing you know the most protein uh they have all the essential amino acids in they've got good and bad cholesterol but um you know they're they're fine to have um things like um avocado on toast with some grilled mushrooms and and tomatoes if you're working from home things like porridge you know complex carbohydrates um but have it a big bowl of uh of porridge um have it with oat milk or almond milk and then add in two tablespoons worth of ground linseed which is a phytoestrogen which is um, also a great source of protein and a great source of vegan omega-3 add some blueberries onto that i chop up a pear and grate some um, ginger in if you've got lots of aches and pains ginger is very anti-inflammatory um so and also there's lots of kind of high protein granolas out there you know lizzie's do a good one eat natural do a good one or make your own but just make it with nuts and seeds as opposed to um, any dried fruit because dried fruit is basically sugar lumps so things like that for breakfast um, and then for lunch, I'm a big leftover lunch person. So if you, whenever you're cooking in the evening, you know, things like tray bakes and things like that, make more. And then you often have, um, you know, your leftovers that you can take into work, you can heat up, you can add in some extra leaves if you like. Um, things like I have, I, you know, staying one step ahead of, of, of your food intake is very important to have a fridge full of things that you can grab for lunch. So I'm a, if I don't have any leftovers, I have sort of a smorgasbord of things in, in my free fridge um, that I can put together. So things like always having falafels, hummus, you know, make your own if you can. I often can't, I don't get around to it, but you know, hummus is dead cheap to make, you know, a tin of, tin of chickpeas with a bit of lemon and some tahini, a um, bit of um, garlic, boom, you're done, really cheap. Um, Things like um, sauerkraut, things like, you know, obviously your leaves, tinned. I always have a jar of olives as well. They're really nice to pick on as well if you need something savory to, to snack on. Um, and then you sort of put all of that together, you know, tin of sardines. How cheap is sard sardines? And obviously not if you're if you're working in a very busy office, but if you're at home, you know, sardines on, you know, sliced um, tomatoes with sardines on top under the grill, you know, dead cheap, pilchards, things that we used to eat, but we just don't eat anymore. They're like 70p or something. Um, smoked mackerel, for example, is a really great source of omega-3, but also very cheap, um, reasonable, even tin salmon, you know, dead cheap. Um, and you're still getting the omega-3s from that. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, so I do have, there is a link, um, it's called whisk.com, whisk as in the whisk, whisk.com. And I actually have a community page there where I've gleaned online all the recipes that I use very regularly. And there's lots of kind of easy fix uh, weekday uh, meals there that you can look at. Um, but things like, you know, I'm a big tray bake fan. Um, so, if, you know, veggie tray bakes are so easy with some halloumi and some um, new potatoes and loads of peppers and, um, you know, anything like that. You can just shove it with some olives. You can just shove that in half an hour. Boom, that's out. Things like stir fries. I used to live in Asia, so we cook a lot of Asian food. You know, I love kind of Korean hot pots. They don't take long. I, I, I tend to have like 45 minutes from start to finish. Um, there's a great uh, vegan website called Rebel Recipes. And 
Nikki Webster. She does a great, um, really, if you have a vegetable box delivered, she has a search function. She's a vegan cook. Uh, search function on our website that you can literally look up cauliflower, whatever, and it will come up with loads of different recipes. But I'm a big, you know, veggie curries are so cheap and quick. The, the beauty of cooking vegetarian food is that it doesn't take long. And actually the suffragettes were... Um, some of the first proponents of vegetarian cookery because it freed them from the kitchen um, from cooking meat the whole time and also they saw themselves as being persecuted like like um, animals actually in society um, but that aside um, you know vegetarian cooking there are huge benefits to that so I do a lot of kind of vegan stuff I'm not as I say I'm not vegan um, but there are definite advantages during the week and it's cheap and like so many, that was an incredibly packed uh, few minutes there and really practical advice. Emma's put in the link to quickspist.com and we'll get the other links if we haven't captured them all for you and we'll um, send them out in the email with the link to the video to this webinar as well. That was great. I'm going to ask you a few quick questions that have come up. Um, really interesting question here, Alexis, thank you. Are corn-based products good or do you consider them as highly processed foods? Um, well, in my opinion, I, I find them very, very sort of um, peculiar, really. I, they're quite fascinating. You know, is it, is it really a food? It's like a fungi, isn't it, really? Um, with, with, when I make shepherdless pie, um, I make it with poi lentils, two tin poi lentils. I add in, um, you know, the callow, lovely, the um, mushroom, um, you know, anything like porcini mushroom paste and mushroom um, uh, um, stock cube gives a lovely kind of meaty taste. Um, and then obviously you're adding in all your vegetables as well. So I use that mm. instead of the corn. Sorry. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm I think I could have told from your face. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That was great. I think if you haven't got a recipe book, Karen, I think you should be publishing one soon. You know, definitely. I think there's a bunch of us looking at this tonight that would that would sign up. Another great question here from 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 Jan. Thank you, Jan. Is it okay to have carbs at all three main meals? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with carbohydrates, actually, there is um, research on refi if you have rice, white rice in the evening, having a little refined carbohydrates in the evening can actually make you sleep better. Um, and the reason being is that they make a, a protein called tryptophan, uh, which is essential to go on to make melatonin, um, serotonin, but also melatonin um, becomes more bioavailable. So if you are going to have some refined carbs, then, um, you know, a little rice in the evening when you're cooking rice, though, with um, white rice, just have a handful uh, when you put it into the cold water is um, is a. Um, a portion size because you can quite easily kind of go over that that would be the that would be my only thing about portion sizes is with refined carbs you know when it comes to eating plants and proteins it's it's really not a problem with portion sizes because i'm really not a fan of calorie counting um i think it takes all the joy out of food yeah definitely um definitely it does thank you that was great then um another really great questions here thank you so much everyone Is, your thoughts on decaf tea so thank you Kerry um Kerry saying she usually fasts and eats a protein brunch at 11 dinner at six then fast from seven is decaf tea okay yeah so um decaf tea um yeah it doesn't have the caffeine in um it still has the tannins in and um these can affect iron absorption but I'm I'm very much about if you have it if you have them with with it with food um then it should be fine um but yeah if you really need a, a cup of tea in the afternoon then yeah decaf is good the only thing is with um having decaf tea is that quite often you we have associations and that's another kind of way of trying to bring out um change in behavior is to stop the sort of the reward cue and one of those things is a cup of tea in the afternoon and actually a decaf tea you know a biscuit will still go nicely with a decaf tea <laughs> whereas um i like to sort of change it up so you'll have a, like a chamomile tea or a peppermint tea or any kind of herbal tea it doesn't quite go as you know the association then changes a little bit you might then think okay i'm going to have an apple now if i'm really peckish or a couple of figs or something like that um as opposed to that kind of association but yeah decaf is you know decaf has come a long way <laughs> in the last 10 years you know clipper is a great so um you know just just be careful when you're buying decaf brands that you're looking on the pack to check they've had the the decaffeinated process through water as opposed to chemical and most of the ones that have had through water process we'll we'll talk about it and clipper you know illy coffee do a really great decaf that i have i you know for me caffeine 
you know, we can become a slave to caffeine and caffeine is um, gives our liver a lot of work to do. Um, you know, it massively up regulates a, a detoxification kind of channel. Um, and, you know, it affects that blood sugar, which, you know, I always say you, one tea or coffee will only last you to the next one. Thank you, Karen. And then we'll just take a last couple of questions and then I'm going to come back around to Mel and to Claire again and then to, to, to yourself for, to, to wrap up with our last few questions and then we'll, we can take more Q&A before we hand back to Mel to wrap up for the evening. Um, thank you, Jane, for your question. So Jane's saying that she often feels nauseous and eating can be an issue. She rarely feels hungry, but it's been this way um, for, for most of her life. Um, she says unseating is my issue. I'm not sure if I quite understand that, um, Jane, maybe Karen does, but um, she's a question around how can she change this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not feeling hungry is very, very common. And I think that's why a lot of women wake up and have a cup of tea um, or coffee and then don't have breakfast um, because they're not hungry or they start to feel hungry around 11 or, or you know, 10, 30, 11. And the reason for this is actually, you know, one of the reasons for this can be um, low um, digestive enzymes and low stomach acid and actually stress massively down regulates our digestive system. Um, this is always the first port of call for me, because actually, if we're not digesting our food, however great your diet, it's a complete waste of time because it's all about how well your nutrients are absorbed. So um, for all of my patients, I want them to wake up feeling refreshed and hungry. Um, because that's when you need to be taking on the fuel and you know breakfast for me is a hugely enjoyable experience for me I, I love that's my favorite meal of the day so how can you change this well um, my my one big advice is to not eat too late in the evening you know our stomach acid kind of follows the path of the sun um, you know lowest digestive function is in the evening um, so um, fasting 12 to 14 hours if you can um, although, you know, if you're diabetic or medication, then please speak to your healthcare professional. But for most of us, um, 12 to 14 hours with just water and herbal tea is sufficient. Um, so that can really help. Fasting exercise can really help as well. Build that appetite in the morning. So if you um, have, you know, if, if you don't have any, you know, if you don't have school runs and things like that, then if you can exercise fasting, this has huge benefits on fat burn. Um, and it also helps to, um, <clears throat> I think, psychologically help to tee us up for the day. Um, I really like um, exercising before breakfast and it builds an appetite. Um, things that can also help is to micro fast in between meals. For some of us, we're constantly snacking. That means that our stomach acid isn't getting enough time to sort of reboot to help us feel hungry. But also the gut is really important. Um, and the gut is where we um, produce something called ghrelin, which is our hunger hormone to tell our brain, oh, we're kind of hungry now. And that could also be something that's slightly off. So gut health um, is, is an important factor. Um, but certainly with stomach acid, yeah, th those those things and obviously the supplements as well. But um, I, I wouldn't want to um, recommend them without seeing you first or, you know, just because sometimes, you know, we just need to assess if it is really a, a low stomach acid issue. But certainly if you've been very stressed, you know, cortisol will down regulate that, which is why a lot of women have issues with digestion, things like bloating and gas and you know, loose stools, quite often the gut issues are because there's issues further up the digestive tract. Fascinating. That was incredibly insightful. Now, Karen, as you've seen, a lot of questions have come in for you. So what I'm going to do is ask my next question to Mel, if you could have a look through the questions that have come in and we'll do mastermind style rapid quick bar with Claire as well, used to at the end to try and answer as many questions as possible before you wrap up. And Mel, um, just, you know, I'm going to ask you a question in a moment, but there's a great question in. It came in at 802 for you. It's 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 quite a, a long bit of copy. But after um, I've circled around, I'll come back to you to, to help that person as well to get your response to it. Uh, and Claire, there were a few in there for you as well, which, which I'll, I'll fire your way. But so we all start with the best of intentions, but sometimes it can be really hard to stick to our plans. So if the if the million dollar question is, Mel, to you first, how to stay motivated and to make exercise part of your everyday routine? What have you, I mean, you're a brilliant, you're, 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 you are such a brilliant um, fitness person. You have coached so many people. 
with all of your experience and your expertise, what are your top tips? Yeah, look, you know, I think the first thing is find time. People say, I don't have time. That's ordinarily the, the first thing. We only have 24 hours in the day and seven days a week. Prioritize it for yourself, because if you prioritize yourself, guess what? You're going to want to do it. So I think that's the first thing to truly understand what motivation is. We talked a lot about this earlier. Find what you enjoy rather than doing something you enjoy, because nobody wants to enjoy, you know, not eating the right things or exercising um, in a way that doesn't make them happy. And we know that women tend to lack confidence. I can't do it because I'm too slow. I can't do it because I, I'm this is that has a great link into motivation. And as I talked about earlier, find people that you can do things with. We're humans and, and most humans want to do things with others. And it's a huge motivator. I know in the past before, you know, Helen, we said, like, let's go for a walk. Exercise is not about bludgeoning your way through, you know, a hard, horrible um, session. Being outdoors is a great way. There's so much research out there around connectivity to the outdoors. So run, cycle, you know, swim, do those kind of things. So look to conclude, make the time and diarize it to then be a non-negotiable and find people to enjoy it. Because if you come and join Her Spirit, I'm sure I can convince you to do some crazy things that you never thought possible and it will make you smile at the end of the year I, I can vouch for that <laughs> <laughs> definitely I don't think there's anything that you and Holly couldn't do if you put your minds to it um well you might even get Claire and I in the cold water at Spring Lakes next year yeah. uh look at Claire's face uh Claire what are your top tips you know your, your own personal experience from working with your patients how do you, what would you, how, what would you advise people to do to find their motivation? And um, you're on mute. Uh, unmute myself is what I do to find, help people find motivation. Yeah, no, look, it's really tricky time for many women. You are dealing with brain fog, poor sleep, poor concentration, juggling a lot of stuff. And so, you know, listening to us say you've got to change everything can be completely overwhelming. So my advice is start really small. If you're feeling terrible, if you can just find the small wins and win them. So set yourself up for success by, you know, if you're not doing any exercise, just go out for a walk for five minutes, set a timer, download Audible or alternative, you know, and then you can tick off, I've done five minutes, come back, it's a positive, you know, it's more than you were doing before and build up really slowly. So just pick one thing, you know, if your brain is feeling adult and you're getting all this input, pick one small thing that will just switch your brain off and get you moving. And then you can build and build from there. That would be my advice. Yeah, Thank and you, look, Claire. sorry, just to quickly, mm. you know, we call it exercise snacking. It is those mm. bite sized chunks. When you look mm. at, you know, and Claire will say it, I'm sure, many times a day, the exercise that you should do, people go, oh my God, 150 minutes, I'm never mm. going to be able to do mm. that. Mm. But if you were to do, as an example, you know, five to 10, five minute, the kettle boils, do some squats, the kettle boils, walk up and down the stairs you would easily understand it's actually really achievable. And I, I learned that buzzword from the wonderful Dr. Nigga Arif last week. So exercise snacking is the way forward, hey, Claire? Oh, I like that. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. I can give you yeah. that one for free. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Excellent advice there, guys, and really practical. Now, Karen, as, as you've seen, lots of questions in here for you. We've got about slightly less than five minutes. Um, do you want to just kind of share your thoughts on them and we can go through them? And yeah. I, I'm very personally very curious about the green tea question. And there's a, you might not have seen in the Q&A, yeah. there's a question about sugar substitutes as well. OK, um, yeah. So really quickly, the, the green tea. Yes, green tea has something in it called L-thionine, which is very good for anxiety. I would recommend the decaf uh, green tea versions. 
Um, there was one um, about matcha antioxidants. I mean, to me, um, I would rather you have more um, brightly colored or dark berries and, and fruits and veg um, to get those antioxidants. And antioxidants are incredibly important for our brain health. Uh, there's nothing more toxic to the brain than sugar and um, and stress, actually. But antioxidants, really important. There was a question about foggy head. I would say the flavonoids um, that we get from those dark berries, pomegranates, plums, um, blueberries, and also the dark green leafy vegetables are incredibly important to help oxygenate our brain, um, as well as omega-3s. Omega-3 stacks of research on omega-3 and brain health, um, especially in cases of depression and low mood. Um, food and behavior research is a great resource as well. Um, and if you have kids, um, lots of stuff on there uh, with neurodiv for neurodiversity by divergent kids as well um and then there's this um thing here about uh, intermittent fasting so i am a really big fan of intermittent fasting just because um it makes us more mindful of food you know we have our bodies haven't changed in twenty thousand years we are designed to have times of feast and famine but now we don't we just eat all, all passively mindlessly eat all the time because we're so stressed um but I would say for me, my rule of thumb is sort of 12 to 14 hours is something that we can do really easily. The 16 hour um, window for me means that most people just miss breakfast and for me um, are and, and have caffeine. And that's the other thing with intermittent fasting. A lot of them will be saying, oh, yeah, fine, have your caffeine. That's, you know, that's not food. Well, it it affects our hormones. Um, we hang off our hormones with caffeine. It affects, you know, it mobilizes stored glucose from the liver, which basically takes you out fasting. So as soon as you have caffeine, you're not fasting anymore. Um, and for me, there was, um, you know, for me, uh, fasting exercise, um, there is lots of research on fasting exercise. I don't know what this um, this was about what, um, eating within an hour of waking up. Um, I, I haven't seen um, research to suggest that's, that's what one should do. Um, but when we fast, when we exercise fasting, having fasted for 12 to 14 hours, that means that our blood glucose is back to its set point. Um, so we're much more um, easily going to draw down on our fat stores and fat burn um, to mobilize. Uh, it, it won't increase stress in your body. You're actually doing what your body is designed to do, which is to move in order to get food. Um, we were always supposed to anthropologically walk or run to find food, whereas now we don't do that. So it, it, to me, it fits exactly with how our bodies like to work, like to um to be so I think that was oh and there was just one note about supplementation I'm a big fan of supplementation but I'm very much about not using it as a way to hide the cracks of I think that's the, the expression that was used um, of our diet it's always food first don't underestimate the power of food to bring about health change you don't need to supplement um, but um, we, we live in a world that is so far removed from nature and our own rhythm as women, uh, which is why we suffer so much with menopause, which is why we suffer uh, so much with our hormones up until menopause for many of us. So um, I find that supplementation can be very helpful, um, but do speak to a, a nutritional therapist like myself, we're registered under BANT. Um, you can find someone, you know, you don't need to see me, but there's lo lots of us who have been trained properly in supplementation because there's a lot of crap out there and there's a lot of stuff that is in the wrong format that's a complete waste of time and money um and actually gives supplements a bit of a bad name to be honest so um you know it's as i say food first but supplementation can be very helpful brilliant thank you karen that was amazing you covered all the questions there mel we'll come to you for that question and claire i'll bring the last question to you very quickly just so you know it's coming your way about brain fog that will be so yeah. mel over to you and I guess this is a question from Lisa, as you say, 802. I guess there's, there's two elements to it, and I'd kind of bow down, Claire, to yours. So she's saying that she has mm -hmm. always done strength training, average of 30 minutes every six days, worked a body part. Um, so first of all, congratulations for being someone who has always enjoyed that. But as she has aged, she's looked at the issues around. Um, so, I, and I read due to the release of cortisol with a depleting estrogen, it might be the culprit to belly fat. So, views on when that happens hormonally, that has a natural reaction to increase of belly fat. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So loss of estrogen can, loss of estrogen definitely increases fat deposition around the middle and um, cortisol possibly contributes to that as well. When you release cortisol under stress, you release more um, sugar into the system to fight and flight. And that probably plays into it. That's very simplistic and it's probably a lot more complicated. But this is, if you put the weight issue, the weight training aside, this is an issue mm. I hear a lot in the clinic. If you carry on doing exactly the same as you did before the menopause, even if you're in exercising quite intensely, and I found this myself, you will change shape. You, mm. you know, it, your body is changing. And so you have to make some changes, whether it's looking at your diet, it's looking at what you do. You know, sadly, you, you will need to look at it. And um, I was talking earlier to somebody about marathon training and nutrition and how that can then change needs in the menopause. Stuff you got away with 10 years ago, you might not get away with now. And it's looking, we were talking really briefly earlier about you know increasing protein in your diet. It may be protein supplements. We won't go into it in detail now. Mm. You you need to change something. I would say basically. Yeah, and in the second and the yeah. second part of her question is about then how she's changed it. So she said that I've also read about exercise three days a week and rest day. Yeah, I can only talk from self. Is I have much greater fatigue, so my need and the necessity for me to have more uh, recovery is really really important. And I guess it's a classic, isn't it, Claire? And to conclude on this question you know what you did in your 20 30 40s is not necessarily mm. what you do now your yeah. body has changed yeah. your ability yeah. to recover is again uh is is very different and then drawing on so much that Karen's talked about is the need to then obviously fuel yourself uh in a way so I guess my conclude to Lisa is try a different regime definitely rest 100 um, percent and then just be conscious again of the the change hormonally from a cortisol and, and estrogen point of view and you can be an amazing person that you've always been you just probably have to tweak it a little bit so yeah good luck Lisa and mm. again please come and join us at Her Spirit and we can dig a bit deeper on that one for you. Mm. Thank you Mel and Claire very briefly then we're running slightly over yeah. um, last question for you yeah. I mentioned of course there's a couple of questions we won't get to but we will be doing this again I have no doubt we had such a great response uh Claire brain fog yeah I posted a link to the symptom checker on the on the chat thinking we might not get to it brain fog is so debilitating that feeling that your head is full of cotton wool so getting enough sleep making sure that you're relaxing, making sure you're not drinking too much alcohol are quick wins. Um, well, sorry, getting enough sleep is not a quick, quick win. That can be really challenging, but you know, just making sure that you're actively switching your brain off. HRT can be really helpful. Um, if low libido is mixed in there as well, for some women, they feel that a tiny bit of testosterone gives them an edge, although the evidence around that is dubious, but some women will definitely say that it helps. Um, using your brain, um, I can hear my son upstairs <laughs> playing the drums, you know, maybe doing something. I found um, revisiting playing the piano has been immensely beneficial to keeping my brain on and very relaxing. So it, it's again, it, it's something that there's no one quick fix. I definitely think HRT helps most women who try it, but it may be, it's a bit like the weight thing. You need to do something else as well. So have a look at our information on the website because we, we um, wrote lots on it and yeah. all the evidence behind it. Thank you. Well. Um, Claire, Karen, Mel, that was amazing. You can see from the insight, knowledge really is power. And I think we, you've helped through your brilliant insights and sharing your knowledge and expertise, empowered so many women on the call this evening to really help them think about 2020 me. Hope you all got it instead of three. You have to put yourself first, as Mel said. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of that. It was great to see, I've no doubt we'll do one of these sessions again. Um, I'm sure we could have gone for at least another hour, but thank you. And so Mel, back to you. Yeah, very sad that we're out of time. That was really amazing advice. So thank you all very much for an incredibly interesting and informative event.
feels like, as Helen said, there's so much more we could cover here. Um, once again, a reminder that this event has been recorded and a link will be mailed to everyone who registered this evening, along with links to all the other resources. It'll also be available to view on the Restless YouTube channel, as well as within our menopause section. If you haven't seen our previous menopause events, you can find those all there too. Thank you so much to our partners, My Menopause Centre, to the, our amazing panel, and of course, to all of our members and to everyone else for joining and for all the fantastic questions and comments. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks again. <laughs>